Good morning, everyone, for this last installment of our European Foundation Center conference here in Vienna. Um, happy to see so many faces after the wild night yesterday. Um, that's you survived, and um, we survived. My voice is a little rough um, after, after yesterday's excesses, but um, <laughs> we're happy to see you all here. We are now here together <clears throat> to conclude the conference, uh, to um, take stock of what has happened during the last two days, um, and I want to do that together with the four moderators that have been moderating the thematic tracks uh, of this conference. Um, but before I do that, I have to apologize um, for the keynote speaker who was invited to be with us um, this morning, and that is Laurence Dubiana from the European Climate Foundation. Um, unfortunately, uh, she um, fell ill, nothing serious, I hope and I think, but uh, she couldn't travel and so couldn't be with us um, this morning. So we are sorry to hear that, but I think we have <coughs> a good and strong <clears throat> so, excuse me, good and strong panel um, <laughs> that, that um, yeah, it was, an, an, it, was, it, it was a noisy uh, place, yes. Um, <laughs> um, we, have a, we have a strong panel and we have a very uh, strong final speaker uh, for today, so I'm uh, hopeful and optimistic that we will have a good conclusion to this meeting. The four strong, excellent, and uh, knowledgeable ladies um, you have met. I don't think I need to introduce them anymore. <clears throat> and they have been conducting four sessions during the last two days each um, on their topics. Uh, and I would like now to simply have a little conversation with you about your impressions, your takeaways, uh, your your messages uh, to us as foundations um, from the discussions of the last two days. And so I would like perhaps to start with the question of what, what it is that we should take away from here. Um, what it is that we need to carry forward to Barcelona and beyond. Um, we have been here, it was great, we have talked, we discussed, we sat together. <clears throat> but what is it um, that we can do from here or should do from here? Who would like to start? Lucy? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have a 21-year-old son whose college career was interrupted by uh, the shelter in place. And he has now returned to college. And he's back in the dorms. And he's, he's now a month or so in. But about two or three days into his return to his college experience, he said to me, Mama, everybody's acting so weird. And I said, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. We should be uncomfortable. We should be concerned. We should be feeling a little bit of um, uh, uh, unfamiliarity with things that we used to take for granted. And that's what I would encourage people to take away from this, is actually discomfort. If you've participated in this conversations, at least I know the ones that my colleagues were, were organizing that we were planning about the urgency of the planetary situation, the struggles of so many people in our own neighborhoods, in our own countries, in our own places, um, the, the lack of familiarity with um, what being dependent on a set of mostly United States corporate powers for our public uh, communications. If you're not uncomfortable, I don't think you're doing it right. <laughs> so I really hope that you are uncomfortable, that you learned a few things, you heard some challenges to your practices and your assumptions, that you won't seek the easy way through because the easy way has gotten us to this point. And I think what we all need to do is, is recognize the um, the pain that we may be feeling is probably nothing compared to the pain that so many other people on the planet experience every day. 
And the very most important thing we can do in philanthropy is uh, to get closer, to be uncomfortable, and to work in new ways because the challenges we face are just so extraordinary, extraordinarily large and complicated. Thank you. Liz. Well, thanks for kicking us off <laughs> because I think that's absolutely correct. And, and I'm going to supplement it, though, by saying something that brings us back to a bit of the past, I think, which is what my, one of my key takeaways were that I hope will continue is how much pride I have in the dedication and collaboration of the people in this community. Because I, I heard all sorts of stories on our journey of what it took to get us here in Vienna. I had a panelist who showed up with a broken leg. I had a panelist who had to leave immediately on a train to have a bill today in Parliament. I had a panelist who raced, you know, or, or several, I'm, I'm sure all of you did as well, from a TED countdown or another commitment. And, and we had the people behind the scenes who have been helping us for two years through Zoom call after Zoom call, um, patiently working through all of our scheduling, our issues, the collaborative energy that it took from start to finish just fills me with so much pride. And I think it's there because we recognize how interconnected we all are, how interconnected these issues are, and how no single one of us can make any progress alone. We have to do it together. So that one was the one that really kind of came through for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any, any other remarks on this? Well, I would definitely say that um, I, I Thank you, Lucy, again, for putting um, the, the, the issues at that level, because I think that's exactly where we need to be. And, and I think what we can take away from here and into Barcelona is the energy and inspiration. And, um, and, and again, thank you, Hans, for um, pushing us uh, towards being really hands-on into difficult issues and address them and get into topics, um, ask um, not only foundations but also external speakers to contribute um, and, uh, and really actually address things. Um, we had very interesting um, conversations on empowerment and participation precisely because we had in the room uh, people who um, are have a professional and experiential expertise of that. And I think we, we need more of them, and we need more of that. We need to get into even, even further into that. But yes, we will need the energy and the inspiration yet again. Great. I think for, for me, um, the thing that I would really urge all of you to take into Barcelona is a massive sense of urgency. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's been wonderful to, to be here and to, to hear the conversation and the debates, but uh, if I may, one thing that the four of us moderators really were a bit shocked by, to be honest, was the lack of urgency in the conversations. The, the planet is burning, democracy is dying, I'm not normally a hyperbolic person, <laughs> but, but these are real factors and we need to completely change the way we are doing things if we are going to tackle these, um, these enormous challenges effectively. So that's what I would really urge you to do as you think about moving from here to Barcelona. Like, what's got us here is definitely not what's going to, to solve the, the problems of the, of the future. And, and if, I, if I may, um, one of the things that I heard yesterday afternoon that I knew, but hearing it really shocked me, was um, results from, from two reports uh, that highlighted that um, in, the, in over a 10-year period, um, tracking financial flows going into anti-gender, anti-rights movements have totaled from, from US-based organizations about $6.2 billion from European um, foundations and institutions, about $700 million over a 10-year period. Not comparable numbers for all the data people. Um, <laughs> go read the reports. Um, and the pro-rights, pro-gender equality funding in the US has been $45 million. These are orders of magnitude of difference. Um, 
And those are not people who are in these, these conversations. So it's incumbent on all of the foundations, the NGOs, the media, the politicians who want a freer, fairer world to like get together, work in collaboration, break through our silos, get out of our own heads, and actually work on the action that is going to create this change. So that's what I would say you need Great. to take into Barcelona. Thank you very much. I think extremely important. It brings me, it brings me to another question. Um, because you said you were uh, disappointed by, by the lack of urgency that you felt. <clears throat> but what were the strong moments that you did feel? Were there any strong moments? Were there the moments where you felt there is energy, uh, there is passion, uh, we, we can move with that? Was there anything? <laughs> Yeah, Lakshmi, maybe. Oh, sure. And, um, and others. So for me, one of the one of the things that that did give me actually quite a lot of hope was that um, we did talk about some of the like some of the big picture issues that um, so uh, that that are facing uh, facing the world, and pivoted quite quickly to what are some concrete things that foundations can do? Where is it that foundations have uh, an, an advantage they don't necessarily have, the constraints that many other actors, and what are things that they can help support long-term uh, investments? And so that, um, often it, it can be really easy to, to stay in the, the upper level of conversations and bringing it down to, right, we can actually do things to counter these forces was was hopeful. Now the big thing is going to be turning those those conversations into practical action. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the, on the big moments, there were there were all those kinds of aha moments in the climate track about topics that we have not yet begun to fund. So, for example. Shelter and clothing, or the construction industry and fast fashion, are responsible for 48% of greenhouse gas emissions when you think about all the inputs along the value chain of, of what must occur. And yet there's one major foundation that's involved in fast fashion, pretty much, and only a couple that are really tackling construction. And then when you think about it at another meta level, there's a $7 trillion mortgage market where people who will need to renovate and make their homes more energy efficient will have to participate. There are opportunities to think about working with the advertising sector that has created a consumption appetite that must end. There are new kind of titanic battles we haven't fought. We might not want to frame them as battles, but areas of opportunity that we have to address. Um, some of them are really, really common. Well, we talked about air quality, and a doctor from Bulgaria was reminding us that we might eat three times a day, we might take so many steps, but we breathe 16 times a minute. And when you look at that against the mortality, the birth defects, the scientific evidence that is coming out, it is the most common thread that runs through every person's life, and we have to think differently about how we address the quality of our air, which, by the way, also will help us address greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are also the kind of oddities and contrasts in our modern world. We live in a world where 98% of excess food is wasted, the other 2% goes to food rescue services and food banks, side by side with a world that is still in hunger. And these kinds of contradictions are ones that systemically, as philanthropy, we have to be the sense makers. We have to be taking the bold steps to say that we cannot have these super contradictory things happening at the same time. I opened up my phone right before this meeting and the BBC announced a report from UNEP that said fossil fuel production and extraction is poised to surge in the next decade. How can that be happening? We know enough. We have got to be able to do that. And one last point that was a great aha standout moment. One of the things that brought me into philanthropy back in 1992 as a child that was the first generation to watch Sesame Street and see imagination at play in creating a beautiful world around my childlike four or five-year-old imagination, I forgot or I should say I reconnected when I entered philanthropy in 1992 with that notion. Philanthropy has been at the forefront of imagination and arts, but we haven't really applied it 
to imagining the world we are striving for. We talk about it in terms of gigatons that we need to reduce, systems we need to change, uh, industries that have to collaborate and cooperate. But we also, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this conference, we know that young people are facing climate anxiety. Mm -hmm. And one of the tools that we need to power through anxiety is to think with creatives and think about futuristic scenarios, not science fiction, but the way in which we can imagine a world that doesn't have one of our current labels, not capitalist, not communist, not socialist, not libertarian, but, but bring us to a holistic idea of how we can live fairly and equitably and enjoy the fruits that this planet gives us and give back to it, right? So, so part of me, that, that was for me one of the, the more inspiring moments. How do I apply our collective thinking, our philanthropic capital, our resource, our imagination to help fuel that imagination for the future? Mm -hmm. Clear. Well, I would say that the, some, some very strong moments were uh, about the issue of, um, of empowerment and, and also about how foundations can, can help create um, connections, act as connectors, create safe spaces uh, in which uh, we can, we can um, help a, a, a peaceful dialogue take place. What happened, though, through those conversations was the realization that if we're going to make change, we have to be the change ourselves. Uh, and there is a long path towards changing our human resources, changing our processes, changing uh, our sense of what access actually means um, in order to, to embody that change because um, there, there's a bit of a gap there. Um, so I think that was the, the realization and a bit of the aha moments that we had in those um, in the society track. Um, interestingly, when it comes to participation, we had a poll at the beginning of the, the panel um, just to ask whether people thought that participation was now a given for philanthropy. And in fact, a majority of people answered no, interestingly enough. Um, and, uh, and then another question was about whether um, the, the, the participation was, was part of a systemic conversation between, with their grantees, and there was a, an even spread out between people who said yes and who said no. So there is quite a long way to go in there. And I think um, that is something, you know, in terms of urgency, that is something that we, we have no time um, about, and we need to change that rapidly. Um, another thing is, we, we did tackle the issue of systemic change. That came up in the conversations. Um, interestingly enough, it still seems to be a, 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 a new uh, way of thinking. Probably a lot of people are already working in that direction, working on, on, on supporting uh, core funding and not only projects, um, walking away a little bit from call from proposals and, and getting into other kinds of funding, um, considering uh, long-term support, working in cooperation with others, um, working in a system of alliances, etc. cetera. Uh, but it, it is still sort of, it feels like we're at the beginning of that, and this is maybe something we, we might want to get deeper into. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's what let, me, say. let me ask Lucy, um, I mean, you, you were heading the philanthropy track, um, and many of the things that were just said now seem to me that this, this is true um, for, for all the three, all four subjects and topics. Um, did you see any, any commonalities, any, any connecting themes uh, throughout the, the conversations uh, that you had, where you said, okay, this could just as well be in the, in the climate track, could just yeah. as well be in the democracy track, for example? So, yes, so though of course I didn't get to participate in anything else, so I only know the one room, but I think um, there were a couple of things that people, uh, re that, that ideas that were presented that you could see people really chewing on that felt like they really wanted to engage this into their practice. One of them was strategic litigation, which came up specifically in the context of um, our session on uh, digital rights and digital dependencies. And thinking about that as a, as a tool to be funded, as something to be funded. And there was a great set of sidebar conversations um, from people from different countries because there are different rules and different appetites for taking on that kind of work. Um, but there was a great deal of interest in sort of thinking about how that might fit into whatever people's strategies were. Um, the other thing that I think um, 
And here's, and this is why I started with that question of discomfort. We had a, a really extraordinary session that um, showed both the, the possibilities of, of new imaginaries, but also the fact that the world has changed. We had to do this half on Zoom and half in person. And we had this very engaging set of uh, speakers talking about thinking differently and with different people and in different places, yet we were all organized in chairs and around tables. And so it was very, um, you know, the, the incongruity was very obvious. But I think what I took away and what I heard people talking about afterwards was it's a very um, common foundation response to a new issue to say, we must study this. <laughs> we must bring people together, they must come to us, and we must think about this seriously for some period of time. And the, no, actually, on a lot of this, no. What the foundation people need to do is find the tables where you are currently not being invited, where there's change already happening, where people are doing the work, whether that be about knitting together um, communities that have been heavily impacted by the changing economy or places that are literally on fire. And I come from one, trust me, they are literally burning. Um, or they're flooding. You get two, one of two choices in the US at this point. Um, those communities, our communities, where the work is happening, where the pain is palpable, they are not blank slates. They're not not doing anything. They're very, very busy surviving. And they've got brilliant ideas on how to keep doing that and how to imagine those positive futures that aren't just full of despair. But foundations aren't there. They're not in those conversations. And the answer of, of setting your own table and inviting them to you is the wrong way to do it. You have to figure out how to get yourself to those tables, to those rooms, to those community centers, and then be useful. And the other thing I heard, which I just, this one really surprised me. Um, and I think it's a very, it, it, it's a conversation that I don't understand um, uh, in the European context. We had a session on legitimacy. And I'm not sure what the questions are for you all in your roles and about the sector but they matter. They ma some, there's something there. And it ties very much, I, in my thinking, to the conversations about democracy, to the conversation about social cohesion and polarization. I'm not quite sure what's there, but from the, the kind of confused looks on people's faces and some of the back and forth in that session, there is, I think, a real concern within the membership of, of the, the people in this room about the legitimacy of foundation philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Liz, would you like to yeah, follow I, on that? It's, it's a topic that's getting a lot of discussion. And, and if, I, if I had to boil it down to, to some simple concepts, I would say, at, at where I sit at least, if we're supposed to be leaders in a world that we want to see, are we setting the right example? So for example, sometimes, our philanthropic community can be associated with versions of excess. Luxury hotels, mm -hmm. very nicely <laughs> curated meals, um, things like that. And, and if we're talking about that while also talking about fighting hunger, there's a bit of an incongruity there. Um, are we talking about inclusiveness and modeling it in our operating behavior? Are we making choices about how to travel, where to stay? All of these kinds of things. So, so I think there, it, and of course one that I'd say a bit tongue in cheek, but as I look across the room, I see a handful of masks. Now of course we are sitting at distance, but in our exuberance to see each other, even knowing that we've been vaccinated, we've taken PCR tests, we have been standing way too close to each other, right? So, <laughs> so we are people. human, right? I guess is the bottom line, but we have to reflect, I think, for that reason of legitimacy on whether or not the behaviors and the examples that we're setting are the ones we want mm. everyone to imitate. Mm. Lakshmi, from the point of view of democracy, I mean, Liz was just talking about legitimacy. How, how does that link with philanthropy in democracy? Well, I think 
AB said it in the, in the opening plenary. She said that we have a legitimacy crisis in philanthropy. Um, and that's, a lot of that is about who is in the foundations, who is in these conversations, who are you not just inviting to come in, but facilitating all of the barrier, uh, you know, facilitating them to, to get over all of the barriers that are put in place by the, the world that we live in to be integral parts of these conversations. We can't have conversations in 2021 about what we're going to do to people, yeah. right? It's just, it's not serious. I'm sorry to put it that way. Yeah. Um, really? You know, we have to, if, if we are actually serious about upholding democratic principles, working with grantees as partners, we have to treat them as partners. I say we, I'm not from a philanthropic organization. <laughs> um, but you know, like it can't be an us and them. It's a, we are all have to work together to create a better world for all of us. And, and there's a whole host of ways we can do that. But I think looking it in the face, naming it, and putting in place practical solutions is the way to go. I see a lot of people who've said, oh, yes, it would be good if, or yes, we really ought to do that. But there's always a but. Come on, there are some incredible brains in this room. Like we can sort out how to have a proper legitimate conversation with the right people in the room. That's the baseline to be able to get the real solutions that are going to create change in the world. So in, in the integrative cooperation is what creates legitimacy, is what you're saying, of course. Thank you. Claire. Well, I would just add to, to this, and I very much agree with what Lakshmi just said, and this has been largely discussed in the, in, in the, in the track. Um, I, I would say we're, we're talking very much about um, the issue of trust. Um, how do we... Uh, trust our partners and how do we trust that we can build things together? How do we trust that we can put in place processes and we're not sure what the outcomes are going to be, but we need to trust the process and we need to trust what we're doing um, in a different way. Uh, and clearly, um, as, as Lakshmi said, um, that we need to have a reflection on on how we work um, and, uh, and, and how we organize ourselves. It's, it's not just a matter of saying, you know, telling people, welcome, come to the conversation table. It doesn't work this way. Uh, we, we need to, to, to really seriously reflect on, on, on who we are, how we do our practices, and how we can change them uh, in order to, to, be, to reach out to people, to be a lot more effective on, on how we're bringing change in the field and change ourselves in order to bring change in the field. In terms of interconnected issues, we had interesting conversations at the, on, on the last panel on transition, where we had someone talk about education, someone talk about um, technology you know, as a sort of overarching background of our world, and uh, someone talking about third places, which is a movement that is, that is happening um, through, you know, throughout Europe, but in other places as well. Um, and um, and it, it really was interesting to see how um, those questions relate with one another um, and how core competencies um, having to do with how we relate to one another, how we cooperate, uh, the kind of relationship we decide to have with the world, um, well, transfers into um, socialization spaces that are changing um, and, and, um, and practices that we need to promote in terms of, of technology, for example, all the, the open sources movement and cooperation that happens there. So yes, of course, it connected a lot with democracy track, with, with climate track, and with philanthropy, of course, in terms of the kinds of projects we're funding and, and how do we encourage cooperation in, in, the, in the, the projects we're funding. I think you, you all have now said what it is that we should do, we ought to do, we will have to do, um, etc. Um, what, are, what are the one or two things that you think we really, in, in your subjects, in the, in the democracy, in the philanthropy, in the uh, climate uh, and society tracks, what do you think are the, the, the one or two things that we really, we really can do and we really need to focus on now? 
as foundations, um, not just as broad societies, but really as foundations in, in our societies. Liz, you're looking as if you have an answer. Well, the, the, the one that, that, that stays with me, and I don't believe that I have the, the, the trajectory yet fully in my head, the path, but one of the ways in which we've managed to elevate the issue of climate, get people to care about it, has also indirectly led to a lot of polarization in society that's been felt in democracy. It's certainly been felt in our own chambers. It's been felt in society. And I feel as though between now and 2030, what we need to do as part of imagining a better future is also consider how we fund unity, how we recognize the most fundamental parts of our human experience and how they're relatable, how we open ourselves up to differences of opinion that do not undermine an individual's dignity but represent part of a beautiful collective whole. I'm sitting here in a European country that has recognized as part of being a union that there are so many cultures and so many different languages and everything like that, and yet it coexists, more or less, right? Um, we, if we thrive on divisiveness, if we thrive on only pushing our point forward, we may lose quite a lot in the process mm -hmm. and not afford a, a transition that is just and fair for everyone and we'll have more of a mess to clean up afterwards. I would hate for us to say in 2030, the operation was a success, but the patient died on the table, um, the patient being humanity, um, and yet we, we managed to reduce mitigation. So, so those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. We have to think about differently um, in our work. Thank you. Anyone? I, I don't know if I ag agree with you or not, but here's, here's what I've been thinking, <laughs> reflecting on the last two days. So I, I think there's a way these things could agree, but maybe they don't, and that is, Throughout the time I've spent in my career working in and thinking about philanthropy, um, it often seemed to me that philanthropists, foundations, develop their strategies with a sense that there's a problem out there, um, but that there isn't, without serious consideration of what is supporting the opposition to the change they're trying to make. Does that make sense? So that, that there's something wrong, but that there's nobody to blame, or there's nobody on the other side. Um, in the issues that, that we took up specifically in the philanthropy tech, specifically um, on issues of digital dependencies, on issues of closing civic space, and I think quite clearly with climate, there are very well organized, <laughs> very well funded, other sides, mm -hmm. at least to the language that's being talked about here. So how is it, how do we um, factor that in without driving toward greater polarization? Because I think refusing to see it, refusing to name it, um, isn't helping. <laughs> So I, I, I'm not sure if it's an, ag yeah. a, an agreement or a, a modification or a disagreement. There's, there's but so I think it has to be a, a new way of thinking about um, the, the change you're trying to accomplish is to recognize that there are active forces pushing against you who whether you push or not, they're pushing against you. Right. And not only are they, you're absolutely right, they're active forces who will give multi-year core funding unrestricted mm -hmm. to support that opposition. And, I, and I, I take the point. I suppose what I'm saying also represents the fulsomeness of what we've also discussed about inclusion. We need a broader set of voices that we've got to engage. Yes. It doesn't mean that there aren't people who are going to oppose us. They're, they're well-funded and they're armed and they don't want to give up on the way of life that they've had. That is a, con that is a, a, a tension. And depending on what the issue is, and I say this from the United States perspective, so take it <laughs> with that, the assumption that there's some middle group that's not as, as divisive on either end of, of any political topic, um, to assume that that group is not being um, s reached out to, again, by your opposition is a big failure. So it's not necessarily playing to the ends and to the, mm -hmm. the very vitriolic ends of whatever the spectrum would be, but to recognize that there's a tremendous effort at stake to shift 
the entire alignment of from center to, to yeah. left and right and all of that. And I, I just, I think um, it, it, that alone is a, is a big change for how I think a lot of strategic philanthropy, philanthropy that spends a lot of time thinking about how it's going to seek these, these changes uh, actually really sets up the problem it's seeking to solve. Yeah, and how to address. Time, how do we make it flying. work? Time is flying. I, I just wanted to say one, we have to make sentence. this work without it becoming the squid game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, Claire, uh, just the society quick, perspective. No, very yeah, quickly yeah. On, say, on this, I, I, I would like to say it on, on the issue of polarization. Um, interestingly, we had a presentation at the, on the very first panel by Maureen Common, who did say that there is a, a, a large number of people called the invisible uh, that, that kind of are dropping out, that a lot of them are actually young people. They're not necessarily poor people, uh, mm. but they, they're, they feel like they're dropping out of the, uh, the current system, whichever you know, it is. Um, and so I think we do need to reach out to them. Um, and in, in the, on the issue of polarization, I think there is a big need for safe spaces and places where we can have a peaceful, quiet, uh, reasonable discussion. And I think a lot of people want that. So I think, you know, philanthropy can help create those safe spaces and we need them. And in that, um, there was also, you know, very quite interesting um, ideas that came up. And, and one of them was that uh, we, we do need to understand more what's happening. So knowledge, uh, research, you know, all those things, they're, they're, not, they're not just theoretical, they're not abstract. It's really about having a better un understanding of what's at stake to be able to act upon it. So I think that's something that we can also reflect on. And what's I feel it has been missing in, 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 uh, in the society track, and I, I feel responsible for that, is the, um, the is culture. Because I do think, as Liz said, that we do need uh, to be creative, and I think um, you know, artists can help us do that. Culture, not in a top-down approach, like let's go, all go to the museum kind of thing, but in, in the how do we create together approach, that I think is something we should reflect on as well. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So Actually, I had, um, there, there are sort of three points that for me jumped out uh, throughout the, the track. The first one is this question of being political. A lot of foundations um, really shy away from this idea of being political. You've got to stop doing that. You deal with money, money is power, power is political. Whether you like it or not, you are political actors. So own it and use that power in a way to create a better, a better world. But just because you say you're not political doesn't mean you're not political. It's very different from funding specific political parties. Yeah. But um, so that, was, that was the first point that, that came up. Um, the second one was um, actually a bit of a, an, an absence um, in, in our track of a conversation around, for example, the, the, uh, of gender or of marginalized groups and how they experience the democratic deficit in a, in a different way. And so I think as you think about your work going, going forward supporting um, democracy, I think it is really important to, to shine that lens on how, um, how some of these, these issues and problems are affecting dif different groups differently and how to, to adapt your support um, along those lines. The, the third was, um, was that there's really, there, there's been an erosion in democratic institutions, um, but there's so many different avenues that foundations can, can follow, whether it's supporting um, a better ecosystem of understanding you know, the impact of technology, whether it's about supporting advocacy efforts, whether it's about, about supporting a free media, um, whether it's about supporting community-based activism in different ways. Whatever the focus of your foundation is, there is a way for you to bolster democracy in the, the work that you do. And then my final point, it was the imp incredible importance of movements, which are often notoriously difficult to fund because it's really difficult to define what it is. But that's often where that creativity, the drive, the, that sense of unity is coming out of these movements. And again, incredible brains in the room, you can figure out ways to, to support those effectively so that they can thrive further. Thank you. 
Um, I think we should move to the next step of this uh, discussion. Um, I'm not sure if we have from, from, from the screen, on the screen um, the Menti moment. Yes, we have. Um, get your phones out if you're not reading in them anyway already. Um, and uh, dial or get into that website and dial the code. And please, what I would like you to do is we need one word from you, one word that you are going to give to the new baby that is being born as we speak. Um, we have heard, the members of the EFC and the affiliates have heard about that this morning already. Um, the European Foundation Center and the Donors and Funding Network of Europe are coming together. Oh. Um, the number is on, on the top still, yeah. Smaller, but it was on the top. Um, the one word that you will tell this new baby in its first steps into its new life. <laughs> we are coming together as a really large group of foundations, finally. And what is it that you, out of the discussions you have had the two last days, what is it that you would like this baby to hear, to know, to see? Wow. Humble is still very much in this. Oh, inclusive, great. <laughs> Courageous. Courageous, inclusive, and humble. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting, interesting heritage for <laughs> Delphine to take away from <laughs> and everybody else who is working with her. Great. While this is developing, could I ask our four moderators a final sentence from all four of you? Looking at the philanthropic world and the changes that we are going to see now in Europe with the merger of the two organizations, what, what is the sentence that you would tell standing at the cradle of this baby? and uh, wishing it well for the future. What is it that you would tell them? Tell it, the organization and its people. Who wants to start? W well, the, <laughs> the usual tradition is to congratulate parents when there is a newborn <laughs> baby. And we, we can do that because I, 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 it, it is very important that we have a strong body uh, there to, uh, to, to represent organizations, uh, foundations and philanthropy and, and, and push for that. So I would say, well, thank you for, for being there. Thank you for giving us strength and courage and inspiration. Um, and we count on you for that. Great. Liz? Uh, I'm imagining myself as a single mom at the moment. <laughs> um, but I think I would say to my beautiful baby in the cradle, I'm going to work with the whole village to raise you. Mm -hmm. mm. Lucy. Well, first of all, Mazel Tov. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> foundations, in order to exist, require a planet and thriving democracies. Neither the planet nor thriving democracies require foundations. Think about that. <laughs> Lakshmi. Um, just thinking back to, uh, to the, the sleep-deprived days when, um, <laughs> when I had, when I had a, a newborn, um, I do not wish you the sleep-deprived days. <laughs> what I do wish you is newborns challenge you in different ways, but they make you better people. And that's what I would wish on this new foundation, is challenge the foundations that are members, help, help bring them out of their comfort zone, help bring them into the space where they can have a much greater impact, and I think you will do a phenomenal job. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being with us, for doing this, and for... And, and for the hard work you have put into this, we really profited from this. Thank you very much. Please stay, as I'm asking now.
Kumi Naidu on stage. Um, Kumi, you were graciously accepting to be the final speaker for today. Um, we're looking forward to hear from you. Um, you've, you've watched us. Um, you, have, you know us for, for many years already. Uh, you have watched us today, yesterday, the day before. Um, what is your take on what we've been trying to do here and what are you going to tell us as final famous, famous last words for the conference? Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Greetings, friends and colleagues. I must start with a confession that I think I was much more courageous when I was a 15-year-old activist standing in front of an audience speaking than I am now. <laughs> I am extremely nervous, because not only because of the pandemic and not sure exactly what I should be doing, whether to greet like this or to greet like that, but perhaps the best way I can express my nervousness is to share a short anecdote. Speaking to an audience in the United States a couple of years ago, I was going through, you know, how our forests are collapsing, our inequality was increasing, our democracy was being destroyed, our oceans were dying, and so on. And at the end of it, a very irate delegate put up a hand and said, Mr. Naidu, have you heard of Martin Luther King? And I said, yes, he inspired me and many people in my country as a young activist. And then she said, do you know what his most famous speech was called? Thinking it was a trick question, I answered it very gently. I said, I have a dream. And she shouted back, yes, it's I have a dream, but when I hear you speak, it sounds like you have a bloody nightmare. <laughs> and she said, how do you move people forward if you are only focused on what's going wrong. And I want to say that that is the biggest, biggest challenge of leadership that we face now. For activism as well as for the philanthropic community. On the one hand, we cannot, as the democracy track through Lakshmi says, we need to have a maximum sense of urgency because that's what the science is saying, that is what reality on the ground is saying. However, we have to also do what Claire says and what the society track says, which is that we have to celebrate the notion of empowerment, the notion of participation, and to embrace culture as part of activism. One of the mistakes that many of us make in activism, and I think also in philanthropy, is that we assume that those that have power and control exercise that power and control over society by primarily deploying what you could call the repressive state apparatus, the army, the police, formal laws, and so on. But actually, the reality is that in many countries around the world today, in almost all countries, I would say, the more powerful form of control, the more insidious form of control is actually exercised by what you could call the ideological state apparatus, by which I mean the framework for education, the framework for religion, social norms and customs, and critically, the framework for communications and media. And unless we invest seriously in our understanding about why it is that so many good people have left values of human rights, justice, equity, and so on, and moved to values of exclusion, them, us versus them, and so on, we are not going to turn things around. Because there are far too many people in this world of ours who actually do not have access to equitable, diverse, a whole range of information that allows them to participate effectively in public life. And there's no question that many people, from vaccine hesitancy to climate hesitancy, they have been led to believe false things that have been put before them in very powerful ways. Can I get the first... Uh... So, I was just wanting to reflect on how do we at the moment, think about affecting change. And I want to suggest that there are three levels of intervention, macro, meso, and micro. By macro, I mean 
governance change by meso, I mean policy change by micro, I'm meaning delivery of projects and programs. Now, Lucy and the climate track said, be careful of easy ways, I think is what you said. And yeah, I think when I look at why philanthropy chooses to put its resources, and by the way, let me just say the level of investment here is not by any scientific uh, calculation. <laughs> it's my impression of where the, so you might have different impressions, but just bear with me for the, for the sake of the argument, that today if we look at where most of our resources are going, 80% is going to the delivery of projects and programs, 15% to policy change. That's increased quite a lot, by the way, over the last two decades. And then about 5% on um, governance changes. So just to make the example clear, as a young person fighting against apartheid, um, you know, you could say, let's try and change the education system and let's try and figure out how to make policy changes in the education system. But how far could you go with that if the overall governance system was flawed, right? And today we have a crisis of defective governance institutions in many societies from the local level governance to the, to, to the global level. And, and at the global level, we have a serious problem because, you know, some of you might remember there was a slogan in the 1980s that said, think globally, act locally. What was behind that slogan was irrespective of what issue you were tackling at the local or national level, you needed to better understand our global processes, global discourse, global institutions had an impact on what you could or could not achieve. And then in the 1990s, a woman called Deviki Jain, together with other women from the global south, set up a new women's movement called DAWN, Development Alternatives of Women in a New Era. And they said, hang on a minute, if we think globally and we act only locally, then that's a problem because around many issues, real power is shifting from the local or national level to the global level. So whether it's about vaccines, whether it was about HIV AIDS and the pharmaceuticals that was needed, whether it's climate, whether it's uh, a whole range of issues today, don't respect national boundaries. And so she said, no, maybe we need to turn it upside down. Maybe we need to think locally what we need, and if real power exists at the global level, that's where we need to put our energies. I don't think we have that choice, one or the other. Today, philanthropy needs to be looking at which are the right levers of change. So for some things, it might be better to invest locally. For some things, it's better to invest globally and some things better nationally. So I think it's a much more difficult moment, but period of success, why I got that there is to put a challenge to say, you know, is it why do we choose those things? Is it because we're looking for quick returns, magic bullets, and so on? Because actually to change a governance system takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. And I applaud the brilliant leaders of our four tracks here because all of them are saying we need to be in it for the long haul, right? We need to have a sense that the struggle for justice is a marathon and not a sprint. Can I get the next? Uh... So I want to argue that one of the biggest weaknesses in both activism and philanthropy is that we far too often focus on what people don't have. You know how people are excluded, marginalized, exploited, oppressed, repressed, and so on. And of course we need to do that. Of course we need to do that. But if we don't balance that by looking at the capabilities that people still have, notwithstanding all that exclusion and marginalization, we are never going to see the potential of people to be agents of their own change. I guarantee you that even if philanthropy globally, if Father Christmas came a bit early this year and suddenly gave a 5,000 increase in your budgets, you're never going to be able to meet your visions and missions unless we understand the agency of ordinary people. And so I've been 
Oh, unfortunately, things are getting cut off here, but I'll tell you what. So the left quadrant, which, which I call top left, where I say harnessing our autonomy. And yeah, why I put, I try to flip things around and, and to say to philanthropy, please start with what power people have so you can build on that. So people have power as citizens and voters. And yeah, I will just note that in many countries around the world, we have defective election systems, right? Um, you know, if you take the United Kingdom as an example or India as an example, you're talking about two very powerful governments which effectively have a 31% mandate if you look at the number of people that voted for them, right? Uh, in real terms, because of uh, the way the election system is uh, manipulated. People, but I would appeal though, we don't have an option. With creativity and so on, we can make change happen and I would urge not walking away from the electoral systems and from the democratic systems, however defective they might be. Instead, let's look at how we build them and make them deliver the purpose that which they were intended to originally. People also have powers as, advanced, as enforcers of transparency and accountability. In my country, where the leader of the party that Mandela led, which I was a rank and file member of, has engaged in industrial scale looting of our country. And because of the electoral dominance, it was very hard to actually hold them account. But because we were able to use progressive media and activism, we are beginning to claw back some of the billions that were stolen by that regime. People have power as shapers of our own destiny through movements, NGOs, trade unions. I think that's what we always focus on as philanthropy. Let, let, let's be honest. Philanthropy has put most of its energy in that direction, and it's not bad to do that. But to put all your eggs in that basket and, be a, and pretend that activism only comes from organized sectors of society and not looking at the fact that there's much more ways in which people participate, I think is an error. Lastly, people have power as volunteers taking private action for the public good. I would humbly say to you from an African perspective, we would have lost hundreds of thousands of people during the pandemic if it were not for neighbors offering support and solidarity to neighbors. Our governments were not able to do that. And we need to celebrate the people who are sometimes dismissed as, you know, they just run cake sales and bake sales and, and, and do little charity effort. We need to pick up the power of the spirit of volunteerism because from a respecting the, the fact that people can give up time, energy, resources and so on to, to contribute to society is how we build a more stronger civil society at the end of the day. On the bottom, again, I want to just say a big thank you to Claire and the Society Track for picking up the power of and the role of art. I want to just give you a small example. I was on a little inflatable boat in 2011 going to occupy an oil rig in Greenlandic Arctic. And while I was on it, my two Greenpeace colleagues with me sort of could see that I was, okay, I could use a range of words to express how nervous I was, that I was really scared. Uh, said to me, oh, don't worry, Kumi, if you fall into the water here with the suit that you're wearing, you'll survive at least two hours. <laughs> so I looked at how way, big the waves were, and I was like panicking. I'm thinking, shoo, those waves look so big, I might actually be there for more than two hours. And I'm not a good swimmer at all. Actually, I, actually I'm a barely a swimmer. And I was thinking, if this is the last action that I engage in, right, most of the people back home, wouldn't understand the banner that I was holding. It said, stop Arctic destruction, right? This was 2011, more people understand it now, right? But still, most people wouldn't understand that slogan today. And when I, was, when I came out of prison and I was chatting with some young people in my family, one of the youngsters said to me, you know, Uncle Kumi, a better slogan would have been, save Santa Claus now. <laughs> but think about it, it's absolutely brilliant. By the way, I do know that Santa Claus doesn't exist. 
But still, I would say it's absolutely brilliant because one of the mistakes that philanthropy and particularly activism makes is projecting our consciousness on the people that we are trying to win over rather than humbling ourselves, understanding where people are and building and starting from where they are. The only association that ordinary people have with that part of the world is that Santa Claus hangs out there, right? So, I mean, it would have been pretty great action if they actually put me in a Santa Claus uh, suit and I climbed up the rig with that, but it might have been much more colder than it was in the end. So, people have power as custodians of ancient wisdom, and yeah, I just want to pick this up and say that one of the things colonialism sought to do, apart from economic domination, was to decimate indigenous knowledge systems, right? And right now, as we look at where the world is, we need to recognize that we need the thinking and the power of indigenous peoples from around the world. We are not going to go forward without, with this climate solution if we do not embrace the full wisdoms coming from indigenous peoples. And thankfully, notwithstanding the power of colonialism, many of the ancient wisdoms have not been completely obliterated, and we need to draw on that. So I'm just going to jump quickly to the top, and that one there says, harnessing our wealth. Now, you might think, well, you know, if you're working with poor people, okay, now foundations, that means something differently when you say harnessing our wealth. But I just want to say, as society as a whole, you might think, well, people have power as oldest of bank accounts, but in most countries, you know, few people have a lot of money, most people have very little. I want to give you a quick inspirational example. In Australia in 2015, when the Australian government was pushing forward to build the largest coal mine in Australia and one of the largest in world history in Queensland, the citizens in Australia mobilized through various civil society formations and went to the banks, picketed outside, whether they had five Australian dollars or whether they had five million Australian dollars, they were there until all four banks said, we are not going to fund this coal mine. And I think that if we are looking for accelerated change strategies to align where science and where extreme weather events are and where the politics of addressing the issue is, I strongly believe that the best accelerated change strategy we have is shutting the flow of capital at source, making sure that financial institutions, whatever, whether they're a hedge fund, whether they are an intergovernmental bank, whether they are a commercial bank, saying to them, we should not be funding things that are taking us closer to climate destruction and to destroying our children's future. And then lastly, in this quadrant, harnessing our consumptive power, I think citizens have a lot of power in terms of thinking about our consumption. In many countries, we've got examples of how people have um, been able to get change by boycotting certain products and getting companies to change. So I think when you look at all of this, right, and I'm not going into detail in each one of them, I would say that you have, people have capability to make change happen, and I would appeal to the philanthropic community here today in closing that you should try to exercise that power. Then I just want to conclude on four points quickly. One thing is we have to recognize we are suffering from a terrible case of cognitive dissonance. All the facts are there that we need to make big change fast, but our political and business leaders in the main are in denial. We have to find a ways to break that cognitive dissonance and that denial of reality. The second, I won't repeat the Martin Luther King quote again, but I ask you to please go and Google on YouTube, oh sorry, go to YouTube and just say MLK creative maladjustment. But bottom line is we have to recognize that the world we live in today is not the best that humanity can create for itself. We have no ambition if we accept that. And we have to look at how do we push against certain things that we've accepted as norms. Bear in mind, many of the people that are vilified 30, 40 years ago, Mandela went to prison for 27 years, Gandhi multiple times, Martin Luther King 41 times, Rosa Parks a couple of times. Today, all of these people are celebrated as heroes of history, even though at the time they took the action, they were vilified. So I say to people, especially young people, to engage in the struggle of justice is not a popularity contest. You're going to be unpopular because you have to go against what is seen as the norms in society. But to do that, you have to recognize that the biggest disease that humanity faces is not, uh, is not COVID. 
The biggest disease we face is a disease we could call affluenza. Affluenza is a pathological illness where we have been led to believe by the marketing industry and so on, as the panel told us, that a good, meaningful, happy life comes from more and more and more material acquisitions. And unless we can break that, unless we can celebrate community, celebrate neighborlessness, and so on, we are not going to break through. And in this, I want to repeat something that was said earlier. For those of us, when we look at those that we disagree with, right, I think we need to name it, as you have said. But I also think there's a need for basic human love, right? I think we need to really try and understand why is it that the people voted for Trump? Why is it that the people voted for Brexit? What were the insecurities that got him there? Because we cannot write off the numbers of people that are involved here. We cannot write them off. They are our brothers and sisters, even if they don't recognize us at this point as our brothers and sisters. So in conclusion, I want to read you a poem and taking the, taking the inspiration that we need to use culture and, and, and we didn't have too much of culture yet. So during lockdown, one of the things that I did when I was in virtually solitary confinement for several months, uh, I wrote this little poem called, We are all desperate to get back to normal, but should we? Normal, what an average word. So uninspired, it's actually absurd. In a time when we have been forced to change our ways, to pause and isolate and dream of better days, that we'd ever yearn for the world of yesteryear, a world so divided, so fragmented by fear, it's mind-boggling at best that we might just blow Mother Nature's test, longing for the same madness that put us in this global sadness, of me first and screw you and buy four for the price of two. Surely getting back to normal can't be our aim after all the sacrifices, death and pain, Yes, this pandemic has brought us to our knees, cutting jobs and highlighting inequality. Our leaders are exposed and the broken systems they have imposed are now obviously not making any sense. So why do we obsess and resist what needs to be? The end of these failed economic schemes and political machines that weaken and divide, leaving only the elite satisfied. No, we have to be better than this. And if not for ourselves, we must for our kin, our children and their children and the ones after them. Thankfully, our youth has far more motivation to take action and end the years of frustration by, create, by breaking down the walls we've created and the inequality that is so outdated. So now, what are you going to do? Let's hope it's something substantially new to keep building post-corona a human existence that is far from over. Learning from our lessons, respecting all persons, especially our health care and essential workers, were invisible to too many of us before this uh, pandemic. And never again lest we forget what and who really matters, even when all hope scatters. Because this tragedy surely must be our big opportunity to look beyond what has always been and build a world that we can all thrive in. That's the end. <laughs> Thank you. So I just, I just have one final point. Thank you. I, I just, I just want to leave you with a sad, uh, a quick sad story which is intended to be inspirational. When I was 22 years old, when I was fleeing South Africa into exile, my best friend at that time was a guy called Lenny Naidu. And we hugged each other, we shed some tears, not knowing whether we'll see each other again, and we fled into exile in different directions. But before we did that, Lenny asked me a question. He said, Kumi, what is the biggest contribution we can make to the course of humanity? And I said, giving our life. And he said, you, you mean going, participating in a demonstration, getting shot and killed and becoming a martyr, which was what was happening every week in South Africa at that time? I said, yes. And he said, that's a wrong answer. He said, it's not giving your life, but it's giving the rest of your life. I was 22 years old that time. My friend 
Lenny was way ahead of me. In fact, at that time, I believe he was like probably one of only 5,000 voluntary vegetarians on the entire African continent. <laughs> he got the linkage between racial justice and environmental justice. So we go in our different ways and then two years later, while I was a student in exile at Oxford University, I get a call that my friend Lenny and three young women from my home city were brutally murdered by the apartheid regime. There were so many bullets in the bodies, the parents couldn't even recognize them at the mortuary. So I had to think deep and hard about what that distinction was. And that distinction is a very powerful one. It was basically saying, whether you engage in environmental justice, gender justice, social justice, economic justice, whichever struggles you engaged in, these struggles are marathons and they're not sprints. And the best and biggest contribution we can make is to stay strong, to persevere, to keep pushing, pushing, pushing until those uh, injustice I uh, eradicated. So to the EFC and to all of you here, I say to you, if you are anything like me, you'll probably wake up many mornings looking at what's happening in the world and feeling desperately sad and anxious. But when you hit those moments like I hit them, I offer you this wisdom. Just remember that the world would be a more pessimistic place were it not for people like each and every one of you and the capability that each and every one of you have through your institutions to make this world a more just and more peaceful place. Muchas gracias, merci beaucoup, thank you very, very much. <laughs>
might end up in you know, business as usual if we don't take. Every new thing is a risk. We have to risk it. <laughs> You know how hard it is if you have an organization and now we, we risk it. We risk to, you know, to fail and we learn from it. And we risk and we fail and we learn. And we build teams and people who also risk it. That's crucial because otherwise we end up with organization losing the war of talents to those who go for the other side. Huh? because they pay salaries and you know, getting all the creative power. And we are here sitting with a small, nice little bureaucracy. <laughs> so we have to risk, risk it. Wherever you can, risk it and fail if you fail, but then fail quickly and start from new. Because we're talking about South Africa, uh, we had a guest from South Africa here. <laughs> Uh, a very nice performer. Her name is, may, maybe you know her, uh, Koleka Putuma. And she had a tattoo here, right? And I, I really love this tattoo because the tattoo said, I, you owe your dreams, because we're talking your dreams, your courage. You owe your dreams your courage. I think this is, this, yeah, this is just great. Yeah. Keep it, yeah, it's just, I, I leave it like this, it's, it's just great. Now, um, okay, Franz Karl, you come up with me now, because, well, I'm, I'm short. We, we just have to say thank you now. Because, you know, there's another Viennese saying, and I don't want to translate that one, but uh, we, uh, Franz Karl and myself, we, have, we really want to say thank you to all of those who were involved organizing this nightmare uh, in times like this. <laughs> But they're, they're now so good because they did it twice, huh? <laughs> you never find a team anywhere who did it twice, huh? We did it. <laughs> if, I, if I would have a Viennese audience here, I would, I would shout out, die haben sich den Orsch aufgerissen für euch. Now, this is not to translate, but, <laughs> but they did it, huh? So, uh, Franz Karl, yep. you join me now? Yes. And, and we have something very nice uh, prepared for them. It is a Sachertorte. So, again, Viennese. There's this famous hotel, Sacha, and they produce it's, Torten. It's, now, actually, it's actually an imperial I know, torte, but, but <laughs> that's, the that's the paradox. That's the paradox. <laughs> Different because cake. the Sachertorte is not in a schachtel. Is it? Yeah, box, in yeah, a in box. box where it says Sachertorte. But you know, it's all about the content, right? <laughs> and not about how we package it. So you now all get, or not you all, huh? but those who have so they get <laughs> a Sache Torte, right? And I would, I would la ask my friend, Franz Karl. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can so, you? Yeah, can yeah you, I can, can. Can we start? We can start. First okay. of all, I would like to have my dear colleague, Maribel, on stage with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Maribel. I know, but there's a Sache Torte. Maribel, she is the one responsible that you really all got to your, first of all, that the coffee house talks existed, that they were coming together, that everybody was planning uh, and working on them, and that you finally got there and had great times yesterday afternoon. So Maribel, you did so much more than anybody else here, I think, in working for this. Thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Next one. The next ones. Um, I would like, first of all, to have the people from the EFC with us. Uh, and talking about EFC, I must mention somebody who is not here today, and that is Jerry. Jerry, I don't know if you see this, <laughs> if you're watching, but Jerry, you were, you were the one who enabled us to do this in the first place. Um, you were the one who led us through the first meetings of the program and host committees. You gave this, your stamp of approval, the ideas that we had, the different ideas to do this in a different way, you helped us, you encouraged us to do it that way, and without you, 
the conference in this form would not have taken place. So Jerry, thank you so much for this and thank you so much for everything you have done for the EFC. Good. So, therefore, Delphine, Valerie, Leticia, Gilberto, Marta, Francesco, please come and join us on stage. <laughs> Look, come, come, come. Where is everybody? You see it now. Come up. Valerie. Come up, come up, come up. Come up. Leticia, Francesco, come on stage, come on, come on, please, come on, come on, join on, please us. Please come. <laughs> come on stage. Come, 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 come. Here you are. <laughs> Here you are. A little one. Come be with us. Marta, where is Marta? Here you are. And of course, we had our moderators the ones that prepared the content, prepared speakers, contributions, Claire, Liz, Lakshmi, and Lucy. Please come and join us on stage. And they, they had helped us. They didn't do this all by themselves, although I'm sure they could have done it, powerful as they are. Um, but they had helped us. They had helped us um, in the EFC. Letizia, Julia, Stefanos, Ilaria, Silvia, Alice, and Lucia. Are you here? Anybody? Come on stage. Come out if you're here. <laughs> if not, yes, Julia, come on. Lucia, Alice. Great. Come <laughs> and, and tell the others that they were very much appreciated. Marta, of course, join us here. <laughs> Marta. <laughs> and then we had seven fantastic students from the Central European University who were helping as well and who put together these readers that brought all the information, the graphs, etc., on the four topics together. So if you're around in the room, David, Victoria, Anastasia, Elmira, Sevinj, and Maria and Lea, come and join us. Thanks for your contribution. Come, come. <laughs> And then, of course, there was the Asta Foundation core, so to speak, all grouped around Maribel and moved and motivated and pushed and helped by her. So come on stage, please. Mira, Mira. Gerald, <laughs> Giovanna, Elias, where is everyone? <laughs> This, this was the core who held it together here and who made it possible. Thank you, thank you for that. And finally, and finally, those without whose very hard work over the last months and probably even years, we wouldn't be able to be here sitting in this wonderful room, having fantastic evenings in beautiful surroundings, um, smooth processes and uh, everything working well. And this is our incredible, fantastic events team that we have been working with for so long. Claudia and Emily from Events by Spitz. Please come on stage. And and with you, I would like to say very much thank you to everybody else who has been working behind the scene on this. The technicians, uh, the caterers, and very specifically and specially, uh, Thomas uh, and his team of uh, people who have worked as social media people, as film, press, and photography teams documented, that broadcast, and that brought this out. So if anybody of the, you are around, 
also. Come here, Thomas, I don't know if you're around. They're probably still outside filming, yeah. interviewing, and so forth. So we'll thank you, and thank you for helping us to spread the message, to get word out of what is happening here, of what our intentions, hopes, and visions are. Sorry, so. sorry. stop, stop, yep. stop, stop. Uh, I also want to mention Franz Karl. Ah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Franz <laughs> Yeah. 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 More than, it was more than two years ago that I stood on the stage in Paris and uh, was given a flower handed over by Axel uh, to pass on the flag, so to speak. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great travel. It was a little longer than we thought it would be. Um, but I'm so happy that we're all here. And thank you, Boris, for being the institutional support behind all that and making it possible. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thanks. And I would also like to thank all the other foundations that were with us uh, in this. The Programme Committee, the Essel Foundation, the Fondation de France, the La Caixa Foundation, Porticus, the Robert Bosch Foundation, and of course, the Daphne Network, who were with us as in the Programme Committee and who also gave the stamp of approval to try something new, to try something different for this conference. And then, of course, the host committee that worked with Maribel in setting up a wonderful time for hopefully all of you, all of us here, and that was the Caritas Stiftung, the Central European University Budapest Foundation, the Essel Foundation, the European Forum Alpach Foundation, the Katarina Turnauer Foundation, the Narazje Czeski Sporitelni, and the Narazje Slovenski Sporitelni, Porticus, Robert Bosch Foundation, Stiftung Mercator, and the Verband für Gemeinnützige Stiften. Without you, we wouldn't have been able to do this, so thank you very much. And I think, I think the photographer is giving me a sign that he wants us all to stand even closer together, if that is possible. Um, <laughs> like go down, women keep standing. Oh dear. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good. And now Good. the film, huh? Oh. So, so. so. It's a film, now, right? yeah. Okay. Now, Which thank you so much. We have a little film to reminisce about the last three days, um, and this film should then move us halfway to Barcelona already. And after the film, I think the one who has been also already chairing. EFC for a while will invite us to the next venue. But first, see what you've been doing for the last days here. For the European Foundation Center for 30 years of history, the most important activity has to be put people together and think about what is the future of philanthropy. It's the first conference in two years which I'm attending. And so being in Vienna is the best part of 2021 so far. So that's really the aim of the EFC, connecting foundation to, uh, so that we work together. To help us to network and to make connections that go across borders and across uh, topics. Networking uh, for the for the public good. Exchange about climate change, democracy, how do we deal with the COVID crisis in a European manner? How can we really, really ask ourselves some of the very hard questions? In a way that it is coherent, that, that we are working together as foundations. Cross institutions, cross governments, across uh, companies. Select what are really our, and where we, where we can have impact. What kind of puzzle piece I can bring into the whole puzzle? There are a lot of discussions here about how things are interconnected connected climate refugees governance foundations should increase their activity in the environment this is why 
once again, collaboration between foundations is key. And the philanthropy sector is a sector that can take risk. I don't know if it is an opportunity, but this is more, much more necessity. We have to be prepared for emergency on a chronic cycle. Democracy is in danger. We're in a crisis of the nation state, we're in a crisis of capitalism. We've realized that solidarity is very important in Europe. There are lots of little things happening on this planet that need philanthropy very much. The feeling that you do something sensible and meaningful. Philanthropy has agility, philanthropy has independence. Philanthropy itself and foundations in particular have also taken the time to think about their collaborations. Big challenges like that, the one that we had to face, need to be faced together. Philanthropy can change the country, you know, we are in a war right now. I would argue that foundation investments uh, need to focus. So no matter what foundations are focusing on, each of us needs to have a climate lens. So I'm too new to give you a motto, but our focus is on migrant rights. Now I need to work on land management, I need to work on livelihoods. I'm working on the issue of food waste. We're trying to keep our publication going even through the pandemic. But, uh, when it comes to persons with disabilities, we must raise a strong voice. I'm coming from the humanitarian sector and just joined the foundation sector. We are all uh, somehow ready for a change. We we as a foundation are going through a strategic review. Rethink um, our systems, our structures, our norms and values. Inspiration, a return on natural capital, a return on social capital. Arts, education, science and welfare. Philanthropy, society, democracy. It won't be fair to put only one of the huge global issues into the focus. I believe that future starts right now. It's often a crisis that leads us to more reflection. Thank you, friends. Thank you for all this venue here. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it will be one of the last words, but to be honest, I always was thinking now that this is the last EFC conference. I was thinking that. And I was thinking because EFC was born 31 years ago against a backdrop of crisis in that moment, when a handful of philanthropies with a dream came together at a crossroad. Today, the world and philanthropy are again in a crossroad. The world is facing a series of interconnected crises, you have said, and that will require us to be in our very best. That will require creativity, innovation, unity, work together. In the past few days, as we said, uh, as we also uh, saw it in the film, we have discussed the major challenges in the field of climate, democracy, society, and how philanthropy can help bridge these challenges. No matter what you, our specific mission of, or context, these themes will continue to be of relevance for all of us in the years ahead. Let us look back in years to come and say, we played our part and we played well. In the interest of our sector, we are taking the decision to join forces and create the new organization, Philea, as we discussed this morning, bringing together the strongest individual foundations with 30 national associations and connecting more than 10,000 foundations in Europe. It will make us stronger, more representative, bolder, and probably more flexible to move from each crisis to the new opportunity, as we said in our motto. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Vienna, for hosting. Thank you, Erste Stiftung. Thank you, all EFC team. For, and specifically from uh, my friends here in Austria, in, in Vienna, thank you for your hospitality, for your welcome, for the coffee. <laughs> uh, 
before watching another film that will invite you to Barcelona, allow me to explain a story that came up just this morning to me. When I arrived here, eight, eight o'clock in the morning, we realized that this, this is a chair. I would like to explain the story of this chair. This is the Barcelona chair. Oh, and I said, it's a Barcelona chair. You have to invite you to Barcelona. But that chair was created in 1929 by two of the most relevant um, and creative people, designers, architects, German ones. Uh, it was Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and Lili Reich. And they created for the international exhibition of Barcelona in 1929. And I was thinking, this is, this is, this is our, our, our message today. Because in this chair, I see all the values that we are facing. I see the value of Europe, the value of the internationalization, the globalization. I see the value of the innovation and try to do things different to to, to have results, and also uh, thinking in the Bauhaus and all that mo movement that they created, they thought that they have to put the person in the center of the design. And it's, what is this business about? To think on people. So for me, the chair is not me, the chair is that. So with that chair, I want you to invite next spring to Barcelona. Thank you very much. Global health threats come in all forms, environmental, infectious, and climate related. And it's become more important than ever to tackle inequalities so we can face these threats together. Global health means leaving no one behind. It means putting solidarity at the forefront of all of our actions. We can learn to care for our planet if together we engage in interdisciplinary connection, communication, and take individual responsibility. Para avanzar hacia una mayor justicia social y equidad, son necesarias nuevas estrategias que superen de una vez por todas las dependencias que se heredan todavía hoy de generación en generación. La realidad social que vivimos nos exige un nuevo modelo de intervención de carácter sistémico y en red, transversalizando las políticas educativas, de salud, culturales, sociales, de colaboración corresponsable entre el sector público, privado y social. than the impact related to art in its countless forms. The great strength of culture 
lies in its ability to transform. As cultural institutions, we have the duty to provide resources for those who haven't had the opportunity, because a more equal society makes for a much happier society.